the perfect family. Every single year on April 9th, I visit my hometown and deliver flowers to a friend's grave. Each year is a reminder of what I had gone through on that day 15 years earlier. I grew up right outside Salt Lake City into a loving family of both a mother and father and five siblings. My family was Mormon along with most of the other people in my community. I left the following day after the incident. At the time, I was a 19-year-old young woman. I was living on my own in the city along with my two-year-old daughter. We were doing fairly well. As I mentioned, my family was quite religious and we were very traditional. I became pregnant at 16 by a boy whom I grew up with and also attended my church. His parents did not want to deal with any of it and were not willing to accept it when they found out, so they sent him off to live in Argentina with his grandparents. I never heard from him again and his parents refused to acknowledge me. They made sure to let everyone know that it was not his child though and he simply left before I ruined his reputation. I left the church as a result and ultimately was kicked out of my parents' home. I was taken in by Mr. and Mrs. Michelson, who lived a few streets down. They loved me as their own and loved my daughter even more. They did not have any children of their own anymore as their only daughter disappeared 12 years ago. I think having us in the house lessened up the pain. My parents eventually came around, although I think it was only because they really needed a free babysitter. I finished high school with the help of Mrs. Michelson. She would stay up with Emma most nights so I could finish homework. I eventually moved into the city and rented an apartment with a friend. We started up a house cleaning business which began doing very well quickly. I guess people hated cleaning their houses. I guess people hated cleaning their own homes and would rather just pay someone. This story isn't about me though. This story isn't about me, though, but of my siblings. <laughs> All five of them had been adopted from Russia. Their ages at the time were 13, 10, 8, 5, and 4. I was my parents' only biological child as they explained they were unsuccessful to conceive any more of their own. I remember first meeting my sister. I was so excited as I always wanted a younger sibling. That summer, I had been sent to stay at my grandparents in California as my parents traveled to Russia to bring home my new sister. I remember coming home at the end of summer and meeting her. She was so beautiful. She had blonde hair and big blue eyes. I, on the other hand, had brown hair and brown eyes. They decided they wanted more children and chose to adopt as many as they could. So the cycle began. Every few summers, we were sent off to California and would come home to a new baby brother or sister. I loved my siblings very much and never treated them as if they were adopted. All of them had the same blonde hair and blue eyes. I loved coming home and spending time with them. I would always visit them as my parents never traveled into the city. They hardly ever let the kids out in fear of them being kidnapped or getting sick. The area was quite safe, so I never understood why they were so afraid. My mother kept them home from school and homeschooled them. They were never allowed to go over to anyone's house or make friends with any of the neighbor kids. On the morning of April 9th, my mother called me and said they had decided to adopt one more child. She said they would make the drive into the city as they were in a rush to the airport and did not have time to send the kids off to my grandparents. She explained that the birth mother of the child they were adopting had gone into labor early and they had to rush out to Russia and meet the baby. An hour later, she was banging on my door. I barely opened the door as she shoved the kids in and ran back to the vehicle. I didn't even have a chance to say a word. The rest of the day went fine as the kids were so excited to finally leave the house and visit me in the city. I let them enjoy their freedom and took them to the zoo, the movies, and Chuck E. Cheese's as it may be the only time in their childhood that they experience it. That night though, it was impossible to get my four-year-old sister Susie to stop crying and fall asleep. My eight-year-old brother David explained that she couldn't fall asleep without her stuffed elephant. I asked her where it was and she said she left it at home. I was going to have to make the 45-minute trip back home to get it if anyone wanted to sleep that night. I left the kids and my daughter at my apartment as my roommate agreed to watch them. I was so lucky to have such a great friend and often still think about her. As I pulled up to the house, I noticed several lights were on. 
I figured my parents must have forgotten to turn them off as they were in a rush. I knew where the spare key was, so I had no trouble getting in. As I walked in, though, I heard some talking and some groaning. My first instinct should have been to phone the police of intruders, but no, I was too stubborn and wanted to investigate. I carried pepper spray with me at all times and kept a baseball bat in my car, so I went back and grabbed it. I noticed the noises were coming from the basement and thought it was very odd as my parents always kept it locked and forbid us to go in there. My father had installed three locks on the door and informed us that the basement was never completed and it was very dangerous down there. Only he had the keys and I was always unsuccessful trying to pick the locks while living there. I always believed him but was curious what it looked like. The basement door was wide open though and I slowly crept down there. What I saw is something I will never forget. I immediately fell back and created noise alerting them. There was a fail pregnant woman. There was a frail pregnant woman tied to a metal bed with her mouth taped. Her wrists were tied to the bedpost and my mother was yelling and slapping her to shut up. The woman was sobbing uncontrollably and clearly in much pain. Meanwhile, my father was at the end of the bed assisting the birth. I quickly ran out and jumped into my car and sped out. I quickly called the police and informed them. It all came to me as I was driving. Why my father was the only one allowed down there. Why I would occasionally hear him talk angrily and groan down there at night. But her face, I recognized it so clearly. Even in the state she was in. Candace Michelson, who occasionally babysat me. Who went missing 14 years ago. Who had the same smile and blue eyes as my siblings. I called my roommate to grab the kids and take them away from the apartment. I tried making it back as quickly as I could. I met up with them at a hotel on the other side of the city. The following morning I went back to the apartment to retrieve some belongings and was met with some police officers. They informed me my mother shot and killed both my father and Candace before the police arrived. She grabbed the baby and fled. My siblings were taken into foster care and I packed up as much as I could in my vehicle and left Utah with my daughter. I had both of our names changed and all my siblings were given new names as well. We are all now living in Oregon and all my siblings are doing fantastic given the cir and all my siblings are doing fantastic given the circumstances. Just this winter just this past winter I witnessed the oldest of my brothers graduate with a degree in computer engineering. For as my mother she was never caught and the only time she's tried contacting us is when she sent a letter to my grandparents' house. I try to visit them every couple of years, although I have never revealed to them my name change or where I now live. She informed me in her letter that she was sorry for all she put us through, but she was pressured to have a family and was devastated to find out she couldn't provide my father with more children. So she did what she could to make it happen. She told me the baby was a boy and that they were both doing well. I handed the letter over to the police, but they weren't able to trace it. So she's still out there somewhere. Let me hear your voice. I know scary stories are fun to read, but they can also be warning. I'm writing and posting this only because I know the people that come here will actually read the whole thing, maybe even with interest. I want to tell my story so that no one is stupid enough to make the same mistakes that I have. I'll make it quick. Do not take this lightly. I, for one, do not like talking on the phone. I don't know why, I've become more and more antisocial over the years, and I only make an effort to hang out with a select group of people. Even with my best friend Katie, our conversations are almost always through text. It's sad, but it's the reality of times. Everyone wants what they want fast, and with minimal effort. There are a million reasons why our technology addiction is harmful to us as a society, but I'm not talking about any of that right now. I'm talking about a real, immediate danger. When you text, just like when you talk to someone online, you have no way of knowing who is on the other end and seeing what you're writing. Yes, it says your friend's name or your mom's name because that's how you saved it in your smartphone. But what if that precious device ends up in the hands of a predator? When you speak to someone face to face, or God, even over the phone, you can hear their voice. You can tell that you are speaking to the person you intended to speak to, and you can hear things like sadness, distress, or joy in the tone of their voice. Through text, you don't know. You just don't know. You may think you know, and that something weird like this won't happen to you, but you're wrong. 
That's what I thought too. Keep reading, please. A few weeks ago, my boyfriend was out of town visiting his family, so I had the apartment to myself. I was excited to get some alone time, but I also offered my couch to my friend Katie, who was in between apartments at the time and had nowhere to stay. I told her to stay any time, but that she should definitely stay that weekend because it would be just us and she wouldn't have to feel weird staying over when my boyfriend was there. Plus, we could have a girls' night like we used to when we lived together. It was a Friday night and I was tired from a long day at work, but I told her to come over whenever. She said she would be out late with her friend John and would probably just stay at his place. I said okay and went to bed early. I live with my boyfriend for about a year now and I've definitely gotten used to having someone here at night. I've always been a little scared of the dark and I'll admit that while he was gone, I left on all the lights in the apartment and I double bolted the front door and my bedroom door and left the TV on. I'm a wimp, I know. That night, I fell asleep around 11 p.m. and woke up around 1 a.m. to a text from Katie saying she really needed to come over. It said, Please, can I come over? I have nowhere else to go. I told her to go ahead, but to call me when she got here and knock because I would probably fall asleep again. She said to just leave the door unlocked and she would be quiet coming in and lock it behind her. I felt a little weird about it because it was late at night and I was being a little paranoid, but in the end I figured it was a safe neighborhood and I would just lock my bedroom door for good measure. I told her I would leave it unlocked. Thank you, I'll see you soon, she wrote. No problem, the address is 1422 Mount Vernon, apartment 3, in case you didn't save it from last time, I wrote. Katie had only been over once and... I didn't want her to call me and wake me up again when she realized she couldn't remember which building it was. I fell asleep with my phone in my hand and the lights on with the bedroom door locked just in case. I woke up the next morning around 7am and needed to go to the bathroom. I checked my phone and saw that Katie had gotten in around 1.30am. I'm here, she said. I opened my door and looked around. She was gone. The blankets on the couch were moved so she must have slept over and left early for work. I made some coffee and when I walked back into the living room I noticed muddy shoe prints all over the living room rug. God damn it Katie! I went to get a paper towel and saw that the tracks were leading over to my bedroom. There were muddy handprints on the door from the ground to the top and most of it was on the doorknob. I immediately ran to the front door and locked it. Something was wrong. I knew something bad had happened but I couldn't wrap my head around it. I called Katie's phone but she didn't answer. Maybe something had happened to her, or she was just really drunk that night, but I needed to speak to her and see if she was alright. I called three times and she didn't answer. The mud was making my apartment smell bad. It smelled like rotten vegetables. I remember crying then, and I called Katie's mom. I didn't want to worry her, but I just had a terrible feeling. She answered and told me that she was with Katie and she was alright. I was so relieved, but before I could fully take a deep breath, her mom told me that Katie had been mugged when she was out in Hollywood the night before and that they were both at the hospital. What happened? When did this happen? How did she get from my place to the hospital? I should have taken her, I said, feeling guilty for sleeping through it. Last night, no, she came right to the hospital last night. John was with her and said that a man hit her on the head with something when she was leaving the comedy club and tried to drag her to his car, but but John intervened when he caught up with her and the man got in his car and drove away with Katie's purse. He took her phone and wallet and ID and everything. Thank God John was there. He brought her straight here. I could hear my heart beating in my ears. When did this happen? What time last night? I said. Her mom asked something I couldn't hear, presumably to John or the nurse. They say around 12 p.m. last night. I think I started crying again at that point. That was way before Katie texted me last night. Then my phone buzzed in my hand and I looked down. A text from Katie. I'm here. I'm outside the door. Why did you lock me out? I just had to get something from my car. Let me in, it said. I could hear Katie's mom still talking. She was saying Katie wanted to talk to me and that she would hand over the phone since, since Katie's was taken. I looked to the front door and started backing away into my bedroom. Katie's phone started calling me and texting me to let whoever it was in. I finally screamed. You're not Katie! You're not Katie! I called the police and locked myself in my bedroom until they got there. 
They couldn't find anyone, and, and Katie's mom shut off the cell phone immediately because we kept getting strange calls and text messages asking us where we were and can I come over. Unread messages. One unread message. Hey Danny, I know it's been a while since we last talked. How have you been? Anyways, I was thinking we could get dinner at 7. We have a lot of catching up to do. You've changed a lot since high school. You have a kid on the way? Get back to me ASAP. Yours truly, Joseph. Two unread messages. Danny, I see you didn't get my message, so I'm writing once again inquiring about plans for dinner. I saw you walking out of church yesterday, but I was far too busy to talk to you face to face. Give me a shout when you receive this message. Thanks, yours truly, Joseph. Three unread messages. Dan, I waved at you today, but you looked at me confused. I'm not sure what the deal is. You probably didn't get a good look at me. You have a beautiful baby boy. I watched him from my parked sedan on the other side of the road. What's his name? Reply when you can. Yours truly, Joseph. Four unread messages. Are you being shy? Don't worry. It's just me, Joseph, your old high school buddy. You have quite an impressive collection of pottery. I saw it through your kitchen window. We're best friends, so I knew you wouldn't mind. I talked to you at the supermarket, and you gave me the same confused look. Get back to me. Yours truly, Joseph. 13 unread messages. Why are you so shy, Dan? I just want to talk to my buddy again. You left your back door unlocked, so I went ahead and let myself in. You weren't home, sadly. I did take one of your t-shirts from the open closet. I hope you don't mind. Your scent is extravagant. I hope I can catch you in person. Yours truly, Joseph. 27 unread messages. You are so ungrateful, Dan. I have tried my hardest to please you and get your attention with no avail. When I brought you that pie, you yelled at me and threatened to call the cops. Why? I'm done trying the nice way to getting to you. You'll be seeing me soon. Yours truly, Joseph. 29 unread messages. You're too good to answer me? Well, maybe you'll have a better time responding to your wife. I grabbed her today at lunch. You weren't home, but she was. She has such a pretty face, Dan. I'd hate to see it mauled and disfigured. Reply and your wife will live. Make a decision, my friend. Yours truly, Joseph. 33 unread messages. I have noticed you haven't considered my offer. It's fine, Dan. I understand. Even after the human body has been dead for hours, the body is still warm. Your wife's flesh was very tender and was hard to cook just right, but I finally got her to my preferred medium rare. She tasted almost perfect, though she needed a bit of seasoning. I warned you, Dan. You still have a chance to save your boy. All you need is to reply. Reply! Be hasty, Dan. Yours truly, Joseph. 49 unread messages. Why, Dan? Why let your family suffer over a simple thing? No matter. You're with me now, and we'll have each other forever. The preserving oils have worked perfectly. Your body sits just as it was days ago when I struck you over the head with that wrench. Not even the slightest smell emanates from the closet. No one will know. Glad I could see you again. Yours truly, Joseph police file. Joseph Arrington was found dead on scene at 5.54 p.m. Likely cause of death, ingestion of harmful chemicals, body had been dead for 29 days. A Caucasian male body was also found on the scene, covered in embalming fluids. Further tests needed, but the body was identified as Alexander Timberland. Roughly 70 pounds of frozen human meat was found in the freezer. Incriminating messages were found on Mr. Arrington's computer, but were not directed at Alexander, but a man by the name Danny. Future investigation needed. Police file. Update. Upon further investigation, the messages were sent to a man by the name of Dan Gomez. Dan. Gomez moved out of Mr. Timberland's house eight months ago. DNA testing on the frozen meat found at Mr. Arrington's house matched the DNA of Joyce Timberland and Noah Timberland, wife and son of Alexander. Alright, I want to thank you guys for watching. If you give me a like and give me a roar down in the comments if you want more, and I will see you guys next time. Peace out!